so it's a particular honour to be able to talk to uh, uh, the RUSI uh, again. Uh, Mike Carlton, of course, was here recently talking on uh, the Australian, uh, the flagship HMS Australia. And uh, at that time, I was actually in the Coral Sea on a cruise ship talking about the Battle of the Coral Sea. But it's important that we establish a link uh, between the two presentations. And the first one is I'm not a naval architect. And the second one is I don't know Ben Fitzsimons. <laughs> My father uh, did not enlist in the second AIF uh, when uh, the war in Europe started. Uh, he had a view that it was not a great concern to Australia. But he told me as soon as the Japanese entered the war, so did he. So he was a fitter and turner by trade. I was a great disappointment to him. I don't know one end of a Phillips head screwdriver from whatever the other one's called. <laughs> uh, and he went to Flinders Naval Depot in, uh, in, in Victoria and uh, Chief Petty Officer Ordnance Artisanal. Uh, and uh, he was very proud of his service uh, uh, on, on Hobart. And unusually, he stayed on the ship. As our uh, naval uh, colleagues will tell you, uh, they're posted uh, uh, from ship to base uh, around different units. He wasn't. Once uh, Hobart had been torpedoed and had returned to Garden Island, uh, the engineers, participants included, of course, he actually stayed posted on the ship. And so while he had uh, uh, friends who were posted on and off two or three times, he stayed on board. He served right through the Pacific War uh, and was in Tokyo Bay uh, for the uh, surrender. It's a most significant uh, naval battle in military history because it's the first sea battle between aircraft carriers. It was fought in the air. And so it was actually the first naval battle where the ships not only uh, didn't see each other, but did not fire directly uh, on each other. And where are we? We're in the Coral Sea. And, uh, and that's here. Uh, you've got uh, the north of Australia here, Port Douglas and Cairns, Port Moresby, Kokoda, uh, Milne Bay uh, here, and the various passages, the Jomar Passage here, uh, which was uh, the intended route of the invasion fleet uh, for Port Moresby. I intend talking about the Japanese war plan, what the advances were that the Japanese made in the southwest Pacific area, Operation Mo, what the opposing forces were in the battle, the battle itself, the result of that battle and the aftermath. The Japanese war plan uh, was uh, very straightforward. The aim was to destroy the U United States Navy's carrier fleet at Pearl Harbor. They failed simply because the carrier fleet were not there. They were at sea. And you're all well aware of the destruction uh, that was inflicted on uh, the US Navy's battleships at Pearl Harbor. The aim then was to invade Southeast Asia, Java. The principal reason for that, of course, was to secure oil fields, natural resources. Uh, the Americans, the United States, had in fact uh, put in place an embargo on such imports to Japan as a result of the invasion of China, uh, where they occupied uh, Manchuria and set up uh, Manchukuo, uh, their province uh, there. The whole idea then was that their planning at that stage was then to turn west towards Burma and India. And of course, uh, the expansion was incredibly fast. It was a driving charge uh, down uh, from uh, uh, mainland here, and this is the area of China that they occupied, and of course they came down south, and of course subsequently southeast of Australia, when they changed their plan. But all this was done within the six months of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The plan to come south and then west into Burma and India was changed. And there were two factors that did this. And one was, was that they were emboldened by their rapid success. We now call it mission creep. And that's exactly what it was. And they kept going and going and going because of the successes that they were having against uh, the Allied forces. And there was also Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle's surprise raid on a uh, bombing raid on Japan. And that was one hell of a surprise to the Japanese. And so you had in uh, April of 42, uh, Doolittle of the US Army Air Force launched 16 B-52 
B-25 Mitchell bombers off the uh, carrier USS Hornet without fighter escort. They got as close to Japan as they could before they were sighted and they launched. 15 aircraft, they didn't return to the uh, uh, carrier, they crashed in uh, mainland China. One actually landed in Vladivostok in Russia and the crew was promptly interned uh, by the, uh, the Russians, so-called allies. Uh, as you can see there, the casualties, uh, some uh, uh, nine were killed, but most eventually returned uh, uh, home. Doolittle, of course, was uh, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor and promoted uh, uh, to uh, uh, Brigadier General as a result. It didn't cause any damage to Japan at the time. It was nothing like the firebombing raids, which were uh, subsequent in uh, 1944, particularly 1945. But what it did, of course, was it lifted the local morale. Uh, the uh, Americans had suffered the attack on Pearl Harbor, a stunning blow, uh, and they were now able to, in fact, strike a blow back. And it was a slap in the face compared to the uh, fist in the face that they got at Pearl Harbor. Uh, but it caused great consternation in Japan, particularly amongst the military leaders, because they could no longer guarantee the protection of the emperor. And it also caused them, quite obviously, to retain aircraft back in the mainland of Japan and could not be deployed uh, into their advances south and southeast. And so that's what changed the Japanese plan. And they changed their plans so that invading, instead of going west Burma to India, they decided first to expand eastward and through to Midway and, and then of course south to Australia. And the whole idea was to provide a buffer around Japan as well as being able to get access to the natural resources that they needed so that the bombing of the mainland could not occur again. The advances, as you can see here, the driving charge, Thailand, they already occupied French Indochina uh, because of the French having surrendered to the Germans in 1940, the Vichy French government was pro-Nazi, so the Japanese uh, forces were able to occupy what we now know as Vietnam uh, without uh, uh, any uh, opposition at all. Cameron Bay was in fact a major Japanese naval base. Uh, the rest you, uh, you are all familiar with, the charge down Malaya, the loss of Singapore, capturing Borneo, the Philippines, of course, uh, driving uh, uh, MacArthur out of, uh, of the Philippines, one of the great actors in the war. General Eisenhower was once asked, uh, have you ever served General MacArthur? He said, yes, I studied acting under him in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, and then down uh, to uh, New Guinea, uh, Rabaul, and as a result, of course, of the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, uh, having to land at Buna. And of course they occupied uh, Timor, which is getting very close uh, to the Australian mainland. For the Navy, of course, significant naval battles, of course. Uh, the Battle of the, the Java Sea, which uh, saw the heroic loss of uh, HMAS Yarra. And as our uh, naval officers here will tell you, no member of the Royal Australian Navy has, all, uh, has ever been awarded the Victoria Cross. And the reason for that, of course, is particularly in World War II, the Royal Australian Navy fought under command of the British Admiralty, and no recommendations were made. Of course, you then had the Battle of the Strait uh, here, uh, which saw the loss of HMOs uh, Perth, uh, which Mike Carlton, of course, spoke about, along with the USS Houston, uh, which is why Perth and Houston are sister cities. You have, of course, the Battle of the Coral Sea. You then have the major battle in the Pacific of Midway. And then, of course, you have the Battle of Savo Island, just north uh, of uh, Guava Canal, uh, which saw the loss of HMAS Canberra, torpedoed by the Americans. Fact. Of course, then there were the Japanese attacks on Australia, uh, the bombing of Darwin. Most people think of the bar, the Darwin was bombed once, it wasn't. There were repetitive raids uh, on, on Darwin for some 18 months. Very few people are aware of that. Uh, Broome was uh, uh, attacked, uh, and the tragedy there, of course, was uh, that the uh, uh, airliners, uh, the uh, Empire-class flying boats and so on, were actually in Roebuck Bay when the Japanese attacked. 
and they were full of Dutch families who were of course were evacuating from Timor. A horrific and tragic uh, uh, story there. Uh, they bombed uh, Catherine, uh, the Adelaide River, and they also bombed uh, uh, Townsville. Uh, very few people in Townsville know that, unless of course you go to the museum in Townsville. Uh, the bombing of uh, uh, Catherine represented the deepest incursion into the Australian mainland by the Japanese uh, in uh, uh, World War II. Of course, there was a submarine attack on the 31st of May. Uh, the day before the submarine attack, of course, uh, the Japanese launched a seaplane from their submarine, which flew over Sydney unmolested, took all the photos it needed, and decided that the target would be the USS Chicago. What's that up there? Is it a bird? Is it a bird? And so, there was, of course, many attacks by Japanese submarines along the, uh, uh, the east coast uh, of, of, of Australia. Uh, my father was home in Randwick on the night of the, uh, the, uh, uh, of the attack, uh, the shelling of Sydney. Uh, what happened subsequent to the uh, submarine incursion, the mother submarine surfaced off Maroubra and fired a salvo of rounds from its deck gun which landed in Double Bay and Rose Bay. You can buy a property there the next morning for five pounds. <laughs> uh, the people in Double Bay immediately evacuated west to Lura, which is why Lura is known as Double Bay Mountains. <laughs> uh, this went on for a considerable period of time. Uh, as you can see, a considerable number of ships were sunk uh, and damaged, of course. Operation Mo was the Japanese uh, uh, operation to take control of Papua New Guinea. The whole aim was to isolate Australia and New Zealand uh, from uh, the United States. There was not a plan by the Japanese at that point in time to invade Australia. There was a dispute between the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Imperial Japanese Army. The Navy wanted to invade Australia and the Army didn't. And the reason the Imperial Japanese Army didn't want to invade uh, Australia was it would have meant they had to draw troops from China. And the army was particularly uh, concerned about the threat of Russia entering the war against Japan. Now they did, of course, until August 1945, which I think, a personal view, is that it ranks equally with the dropping of the atomic bombs as to the reason why Japan surrendered uh, when they did at the end of uh, World War II. Don't tell the Americans. The whole idea, of course, was simply to take Australia out of the war, particularly as a base uh, uh, for the Allies, uh, for uh, future operations against uh, uh, the uh, Japanese occupation. And, of course, uh, perhaps eventually they would have invaded Australia, and perhaps at least taken control of the north of Australia, at least. Uh, let's not raise the question of the Brisbane line uh, at this time. So they planned a three-prong attack. The first was to occupy an island which is immediately north of the Solomon Islands there, destroy Allied sea power in the area, and invade Port Moresby with an amphibious operation. And so with regards to Tulagai Island, the whole idea there was to set up a seaplane base, and they would be able from there to fly south and east on reconnaissance patrols, locate the Allied ships, uh, and engage them and, and destroy them. And of course, to look then at protecting from here the flank of the seaborne carrier force, uh, which was to land at Port Moresby, travelling of course through the Coral Sea. Prior to this, as you can see, the US Navy Signals Intelligence Unit, which had been in Corregidor, uh, was uh, transferred to Melbourne. They didn't move into the hotel room that MacArthur had taken. Uh, but they were there, joined up with the, uh, the RAM unit, of course, uh, and they detected uh, this uh, uh, signal. That the objective of Mo will be to first restrict the enemy fleet movements and will be accomplished by means of attacks on the north coast of Australia, not invasion. The opposing forces, well, as it happened, uh, the Coral Sea battle uh, uh, was straddled two different operational commands. The South Pacific area, which was commanded by uh, the US uh, Navy officer Admiral Gormley. And of course, you had uh, uh, MacArthur here uh, in the Southwest Pacific area. And then next to that, you had the other great actor in the war, Mount Patton, uh, in, 
in, in Southeast Asia Command. The opposing forces, if you look, certainly the Japanese had a lot more smaller ships, but if you look at the major uh, uh, shipping there, it's roughly equal. Both had fleet carriers, the Japanese had an additional light carrier, same number of destroyers um, uh, and uh, cruisers. Uh, and so it was a reasonably evenly balanced uh, uh, force, apart from uh, the smaller ships that the uh, Japanese had. Of course, the, the aircraft, the fighters, we all know about this era, are ranks with the Spitfire uh, as famous fighters of World War II. And you can see there the speed, uh, roughly equivalent uh, machine guns uh, firing for the uh, Zero through the engine cowling and also the wings. Uh, the Zero could carry a light load of bombs and later in the war, of course, uh, were fitted with uh, 250 kilogram bombs, fixed bombs, uh, for the kamikaze attacks uh, against the uh, American fleet much later in the war. The American uh, uh, fighter was the Wildcat, uh, a similar speed, similar armament, but nowhere near as manoeuvrable uh, as uh, the uh, Zero. Again, he could also carry a very small bomb load. Uh, the torpedo bombers for the Japanese, the Cape bomber, you can see the details there. Again, uh, the Cape a little faster. The bomb load's reasonable. Uh, a combination there of something like 800 kilograms of, of bombs in various configura configurations. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the torpedo bomber, the Devastator, uh, carried uh, less bombs, but they were principally torpedo bombers. <coughs> and you can see there that for the Japanese it was an 800 kilogram torpedo uh, and a, a much larger torpedo uh, carried by the Devastator. The dive bombers, uh, the Val uh, um, and the Dauntless, see the comparison there, crew of two for the Japanese, crew of three uh, in uh, the Douglas. Um, speeds, again, comparable. Uh, machine gun armament, uh, again, very similar. Uh, both of them had rear firing uh, machine guns so that the observer uh, could, in fact, engage attacking aircraft from the uh, rear. And, of course, you can see the bomb load there. Uh, a little less for the valve, something like 250 kilogram maximum or a mix of bombs. Uh, the Dauntless could carry something uh, just around 1,000 kilograms of bombs in various configurations. The commander of the Japanese force uh, was uh, uh, Vice Admiral Nui, who in fact had been critical of the uh, Navy's shipbuilding program. He was a carrier man, and so uh, he was concerned about the emphasis on battleships rather than carriers, and that of course was a, a, an internal battle that was fought in the US Navy as well. Uh, he was given command of the uh, Fourth Fleet, which is based in Truk, which the Japanese had captured, and he moved to Rabaul uh, at the very top of uh, New, uh, uh, New Britain uh, to for the operation. He was, however, relieved of his command after his defeat in the Coral Sea. The Allied commander, the Vice Admiral Fletcher, uh, a distinguished uh, sailor, uh, won a Medal of Honor uh, in rescuing refugees uh, off a transport ship, and he was appointed commander of Task Force 17 which took part in the Battle of the Coral Sea, the landings at Guadalcanal, and the Battle of the East Solomons. This is the plan. And uh, the colours, the green shows the invasion group, which is sailing directly south from Rabaul, uh, through the Jomar Passage here, and that was its intended route. It was stopped here. Uh, you then had a carrier striking force, uh, which is here, coming around, uh, the Solomon uh, Islands. You have the uh, uh, Tulagai invasion force coming again from Rapal uh, to uh, Tulagai. Rapal was central uh, to uh, Japanese dominance in the uh, in the area, and in fact, the subsequent Allied uh, uh, invasion of uh, uh, New Britain cut off Rapal. They never actually landed or engaged the Japanese forces in Rapal. And after the surrender, when the Allies turned up in Rabaul, they were very surprised to find there were 79,000 Japanese troops there. And of course, you've got the covering force uh, uh, as, as well uh, coming down here. 
uh, obviously to protect the flank of the fleet. And from there, of course, uh, they were to engage uh, targets in the uh, very north of Australia. Uh, Nimitz had two carrier groups, uh, Task Force 11, uh, based on the Lexington, and Task Force 17, uh, based on the <coughs> Yorktown. And within Task Force 17, uh, we had a attack group, as you can see there, five cruisers, five destroyers, a support group. The support group uh, was commanded by Rear Admiral Grace in the Royal Navy. Grace was, in fact, an Australian serving in the Royal Navy. And the support group, as you can see, three cruisers, two destroyers. And HMS Australia, HMS Hobart, USS Chicago were the cruisers in the Task Force 17 support group. So these ships are in this group, commanded by, uh, uh, by uh, Grace. HMS Australia, which of course my car spoke about uh, recently, the flagship, eight 8 inch guns, four twin turrets, you can see there. Uh, it had, of course, the usual array of anti aircraft uh, armaments, it had uh, uh, torpedo tube sets, and it also had a, uh, a seaplane, which you can see uh, there, a big ship. Uh, it was damaged by a bomber crash in October 44. Uh, some people claim that that was the first kamikaze attack. It wasn't, it was just a Japanese bomber uh, that had been so uh, uh, damaged that the pilot just decided to crash onto the Australia. The kamikaze attacks didn't occur until June 45. But HMS Australia took five kamikazes uh, on, uh, during that campaign. And in fact, it was withdrawn from uh, uh, the battle. Uh, and in fact, at that point in time, Australia, uh, the Royal Australian Navy had only one capital ship afloat, HMS Hobart. My father was very proud of that. Hobart, of course, uh, was a modified Leander-class cruiser was sister ship of HMAS Sydney and Perth, both of course uh, who were sunk, along with HMAS Ajax and uh, the New Zealand ship Achilles. Uh, Ajax and Achilles, along with HMS Exeter, uh, took part uh, in the famous Battle of the River Plate, which saw uh, the scuttling of the Grass Bay off Montevideo Harbour. It had eight uh, six inch guns in four turrets. My father's battle station was on X turret here. Uh, for a while, he was an observer standing outside the turret <laughs> with earplugs, observing the fall of shot. He got himself a new position after the first engagement. Uh, Any aircraft guns, eight quadruple torpedo tube sets, uh, super marine, uh, super marine wall was seaplane as well. Uh, my, uh, Hobart fought with the Americans right through the Pacific War. Uh, and uh, interesting stories, he, he said that the, the Yanks fought the, the, the war seven days a week. Uh, Hobart, the Royal Australian Navy ship, and Royal uh, ships uh, uh, in the British uh, tradition had divisions, of course, which is essentially a stand down day. Pirate Marine put out the washing, had the Sunday afternoon off, not the Yanks. He said they fought the war seven days a week. They fly a drone, they, they drag a target over the fleet. And so uh, they fly over Hobart, the gun control orders are coming over the bridge, you know, dum, 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 dum. white smoke uh, would appear. He said they'd then fly over the Americans, who would throw and fire everything. The sky would turn black because they had gunpowder. So he said, more often than not, they hit the plane that was falling the drone. <laughs> <laughs> and on one occasion, it, uh, American plane, a ditch next to Hobart, or close to Hobart, so Hobart sails over, picks up the pilot, puts him in the wardroom, uh, and uh, because he had a seaplane, had it down, and he picked up the, the plane. And so the anticipated, you know, built this cradle for the plane, put the plane there, sail back to Subi Bay, flash, flash, flash. And so the ants come along and he said, uh, they said, oh, thanks, thanks, man, thanks, thanks for the pilot. And, and they're saying, but uh, we've got your plane for you too. Heck, man, we don't want the plane. <laughs> and so they got the data, picked up the plane, and dropped it over the side. There were tears in the eyes of the anticipants. It was, of course, in Sydney, the night of the Japanese uh, submarine uh, uh, shelled uh, uh, Sydney. Uh, 
right? As I said, my father was ashore, right? he was asleep, and his stepmother came in and, right, right, they're shelling Sydney, they're shelling Sydney. And he sort of opened his eye and he said, uh, are they landing me here? And she said, no. He said, wake me when they do. <laughs> the difference between someone who's been under fire and someone who hasn't. Uh, Hobart was torpedoed on the Spruna sector. He told me that every night an Australian destroyer escorted them, but on the one night an American destroyer escorted them, they took a fish in the stern. Uh, about 12 killed, one sailor was blamed from the stern of the ship, right out of the ship, and ended up on the bow. He told me the ship's bookie was blown overboard. His locker was rapid before he hit the water. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Chicago, a big ship, 9 8-inch guns in uh, triple uh, uh, turrets, you can see. Uh, 80 aircraft guns, of course, uh, torpedo tube sets, four, as you can see here, um, of uh, the uh, seaplane sea planes in the centre of the And it was, in fact, the target of the midget submarine attack in Sydney Harbour. And, of course, as soon as the uh, Chicago became aware of the attack, it immediately slipped its, its mooring and steamed straight out of the harbour. And of course it, uh, uh, it opened fire with uh, some of its minor armaments. And there are still um, home units in North Sydney uh, that have the uh, results of uh, the Americans firing anything and everything that they could. The battle itself. Uh, the initial movements were the two carriers uh, sailed uh, from uh, uh, Japan down here and they were joined uh, by the lighter carrier, uh, the Soho, uh, which sailed from uh, a truck. And so they married up. Uh, the Allied movements, the Lexington had sailed from uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. It married up with the Yorktown uh, in this area here. And of course they were joined by uh, the support group, which had sailed from Sydney Harbor. And they of course included Australia, Hobart and Chicago. Uh, the Japanese uh, sent a, a force across uh, to land uh, at that island of Tulagai here. Uh, so uh, they uh, invaded that, and you may recall the aim there being to set up a seaplane base. <coughs> Yorktown and Lexington by this time had entered into the Coral Sea to the south. Yorktown then moved closer uh, to uh, Guadalcanal and carried out a, a raid, a series of raids on the landing force. Sunk a destroyer, sunk a transport ship, and in fact the remaining transport ships retreated and left the, uh, uh, the land force on the island. The, the battle developed further, the, the, the strike force has now uh, closed in uh, on uh, the uh, north uh, east there of Guadalcanal. The support group has arrived and married up with the American carriers. And so you have the deployment now of the force, the Allied force joined together. You have the main Japanese carriers here, and you have uh, the light uh, carrier, uh, Japanese carrier there. At this point, uh, the oiler, uh, uh, Neo Show, and the USS Sims, uh, the destroyer to escort it, moved away from the, uh, the fleet as shown there. And of course, at this point, both fleets started to search for each other with reconnaissance flights, principally. And the Moresby invasion fleet has now arrived on the scene, and the aim of the fleet was to come through these passages here and move uh, to Port Moresby. And that's why, in fact, the support group was positioned there. Pilot, uh, US pilot uh, uh, spotted the Shoho and uh, attacks were launched from both uh, Yorktown and Lexington. It's got to be the ugliest aircraft carrier in naval history. Uh, in fact, it was originally a capital ship, and they simply built a flight deck uh, on, on, the, on, on the top of it. And uh, one of the famous uh, messages from uh, the war, the US pilot, scratch one flat top, uh, because they destroyed that uh, uh, with uh, ease. Simultaneously, a Japanese reconnaissance had spotted uh, the uh, fleet oiler and the escorting uh, destroyer here. And he mistakenly alerted 
the Japanese commander that he'd spotted the main Allied task force. And so, of course, uh, the Japanese launched a massive raid on those two ships. And they uh, sunk the Sims, uh, the destroyer, severely damaged the, uh, uh, the, fleet, uh, uh, the fleet oiler. Grace had manoeuvred his support group to cut off the Japanese invasion force, which is coming due south from a valve through the Jamar Passage. He positioned his uh, ships there. He had no air cover, so he formed a diamond formation so that they could concentrate their fire against the attacking uh, uh, aircraft. Some 11 Japanese bombers attacked, five were destroyed. The second high level bombing attack again failed to sink any of the Allied ships. And so did the American B-17 bombers who were happened to be flying by and bombed uh, the support group. They'll fire at anything. And so then the uh, uh, both fleets had spotted each other, launched simultaneous attacks. The Americans severely damaged one of the main uh, uh, Japanese carriers. The Japanese sank the Lexington, severely damaged the Yorktown. You can see here the Yorktown. Damaged crews had initially established, uh, uh, had successfully uh, uh, saved the ship, but you can see smoke, this is coming up from uh, the this is the flight deck, and so the uh, hangars below were on fire. You can see the smoke coming up. And then there was a sparks from an electric motor uh, ignited uh, the uh, aviation fuel. You can see here one of the American planes being blown off the deck. And that's how uh, you can see now Lexington dead in the water. Uh, and in fact, uh, the captain ordered Lexington to be abandoned and it subsequently seen. Yorktown was also very badly damaged, but again, damaged cr crews were able to prevent the ship from sinking. It was subsequently repaired and in fact was able to take part in the Battle of Midway uh, a few months later. But as luck ran out of Midway, it was sunk. And so the result was that the Moresby invasion fleet and the rem remnants of the, uh, of the Japanese task force returned to Rabat. The Australian uh, uh, ships here remained here uh, until uh, a little later uh, guarding that passage in case they uh, returned. Uh, the losses uh, were roughly even. In a little more detail here you can see the Japanese uh, uh, lost uh, the uh, Allies, rather, lost one carrier out of two, Japanese one out of three. No cruisers were uh, uh, sunk, some were damaged. Uh, destroyer uh, was lost on each fleet. But what's significant here is the losses in aircraft. And while you can see the numbers, 69 for Allied, 92 uh, for the Japanese, but a much higher percentage of the total force. And that denuded uh, Yamamoto uh, of aircraft to take part in the subsequent Battle of Midway. And so for the first time, we have the Japanese stopped at sea. And so we now have the measure of the Imperial Japanese Navy and this whole idea of invincibility <coughs> had been destroyed. And most importantly, the Moresby invasion force had withdrawn back to Rabaul. <coughs> Neither of the two fleet carriers took part in the Battle of Midway, whereas the Yorktown did. So again, the Yamamoto was denuded of vital assets in that subsequent battle. And so the invasion of Moresby uh, was stopped, but so was the Japanese Empire's advance uh, through the Pacific. And Curtin, uh, in an address reporting on the Battle of the Sea, took the opportunity to invigorate and alert the nation to the fact that we, the war was now on our doorstep. Because until now, essentially the war was in Europe, the Middle East, and it wasn't directly affecting Australia. So we still had the VFL, the, the races every Saturday, uh, very few positions on the Australian community. And so as you can see there, uh, he's urging them uh, to make a sober and realistic estimate of their duty to the nation. Men are fighting for Australia today, but those who are not fighting have no excuse for not working. And
and it was Kurt, of course, uh, who uh, changed the focus uh, towards uh, the alliance with America uh, rather than with uh, Great Britain. Because all Churchill could do was defend the United Kingdom uh, and no British forces uh, were going to be uh, sent uh, uh, east of Suez, particularly after the abortive attempt by the Prince of Wales and Repulse to reinforce Singapore. So the aftermath, a major influence on the subsequent Battle of Midway because Yamamoto thought that the two, US, uh, two uh, USN carriers had been sunk. But as I've said, Yorktown, in fact, took part in the battle and joined Enterprise and Hornet uh, in the Battle of Midway. And that, with the land-based uh, aircraft, US aircraft in Midway, that Yamamoto didn't have the numerical superiority, particularly when combined with the losses of, uh, uh, of planes in uh, Coral Sea, that he had inspected in the Battle of Midway. And of course the uh, Japanese were forced then to change their uh, strategy in regards to Port Moresby. And they were forced to launch a land offensive, landing in Pimagona, force their way over the Alan Stanley Range, which as most of us are well aware in Australian history, is one of the epic battles, with the Japanese initially, of course, forcing the militia uh, back to Imita Ridge, 40 kilometres from Port Moresby. <coughs> Of course, subsequently reinforced by AIF units which were returning uh, and the Japanese at the end of a long supply line but also with the change in strategy it's as much as Guadalcanal was assessed by the Japanese to be far more important than Port Moresby. So all the resources that would have gone uh, to the Japanese on the Kokoda Trail in fact uh, went uh, to Guadalcanal. Of course, the AIF had finally been released by Churchill uh, after Curtin demanded, and there's uh, interesting interchanges uh, of uh, telegrams and messages between the Australian government and the UK government about that. But finally, they were uh, released and shipped home. But while they were being shipped home, uh, Churchill uh, sent a signal to the convoy diverting it to Burma. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Battle of the Coral Sea.